Welcome to Superheroes of Science. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We co-host Science from the Experts. Our guests are professionals doing cutting-edge science right now. They are experts in their field discussing what they know best. So listen up and learn real science from real people. Subscribe now and stay informed of our latest episodes and show your support. Joining us today on Superheroes of science. We're very pleased to welcome Curtis Kelly. Curtis is a professor at the Kansai University in Japan and founder of the Brain SIG and producer of a magazine that presents studies of the brain and learning. How am I doing? Am I getting this somewhat? You got it. You got it. <laughs> so you have a fascinating background and we're so excited to get into this, but you were just telling us about your life mission is to relieve the suffering in the classroom. So Stephen, yeah, I yeah. to just step in. I want to know a little more about this life mission to begin with and, and also more about you, your your background, and where would you like to start? Can't say that without explaining it. <laughs> okay. Well well first of all I'm not a super I'm not a superhero of science. I'm a, a started out just as an English teacher, became fascinated with science and the brain. And since we're not being taught that in graduate school for you know English teachers, we decided to make our own organization that's gonna where we're gonna teach ourselves and teach each other. And this is sort of following the mind, brain, and education idea that uh, brain sciences are not getting into the classroom. There's a big gap there, and I think what drove me is just what I what you said: relieve the suffering of the classroom. You know, I was a bad language student. I had trouble learning Spanish, so I dropped out of Spanish and took up Japanese, what a mistake, which is even harder. But I could never, I don't know, I just couldn't learn languages very well. And I, I didn't know at the time, but it was because I was in a place where Spanish and Japanese weren't being used. Mm -hmm. So my brain automatically rejected it. No matter how hard I thought I need this, my brain would reject that kind of learning because it wasn't helping me or it wasn't necessary in my life. There was no, what we call language needs. And I see that in Japan. You know, we, we say memorize this for the test and learn this. And there's so many students that seem to be trying, but they just can't get it. They just can't retain it for very long. And English classes can be pretty miserable if they're taught and wrote, you know, translation, grammar translation and wrote learning techniques. Mm -hmm. I've seen, I went to a high school once and watched a teacher and the teacher was great, but there was this boy who just kept his head like face down, just looking straight down at his desk because he felt so, he lost so much confidence in himself in English class. And that was the kind of suffering I thought I could devote my life to trying to fix. So I make interesting textbooks. Uh -huh. I'm a textbook writer. I've written about 33 books. And I make interesting books, like a textbook is based on a diary. Right now I'm working on one. Let's see if I have a copy of it here. The Snoop Detective School. This is the original version of it, where students solve mysteries, murder mysteries and things. You know, nice. like looking nice. at different pictures. They have to solve these murder mysteries using English. So that's, that's fun. And even students that don't like English like doing something like that. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty long answer. Sorry, how's that? <laughs> that's, a great, that's great. I, I especially, I really identify having been in the classroom. Well, you know, of course we've been students, but also having been in the classroom on the other side of the desk as a teacher, I think I really strongly that those, that suffering in the classroom, I really, yeah. I've seen this firsthand both as a student and as a teacher. And I think this is just, it's fantastic that <laughs> this is, that you're on a mission to relieve students of this because I think that is um, much appreciated. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, even now after what, 45 years of teaching, I'm finding new things all the time. And a lot of what I find comes from brain science. Like recently, I was interested in the social brain. You know, Matthew Lieberman gave that great presentation. Louis Cozzolino has a book called, you know, Tribal. I uh, can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's about attachment theory and, and how really learning is a social thing. Then I've done some research on how students that don't have friends don't do as well academically. They're more likely to go into depression, 
having other problems. So now recently I've been really interested in how con students connecting to each other is so critically important, especially about the ages of about 18, 17 or 18 around that time. And so as a teacher, I'm remaking the way that I teach to have students be able to connect to each other, make friends, to work together, to collaborate, instead of the old competition model that a lot of school was based on. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, sorry, sir. You're in my ass. I was about to cut you off. Well, I well, so so you say you, you've you're speaking about students having friends and how this could potentially help them learn things better. What are some strategies you, you've used, especially um, what I've noticed in a, maybe a, a rural classroom is sometimes those clicks run pretty strong and the kids want to work with their friends. And so, so is this like, do you know, maybe I'm asking you too many things. Is this a problem? No, no, no. Combat no. something like this. Can you use okay. that advantage? Mm -hmm. In case there's any teachers out there, first of all, um, reduce your teacher talk time and have students discuss. And we know this too from psychology, brain science, education studies, that really you only really learn something deeply when you get a chance to discuss it and integrate it, you know, or do projects on it, things like that. You can't just listen and learn. Instead of teaching here, you should be teaching here and here as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So for language teachers, we tend to have a little bit of what we call pair work where students will do this little inter, you know, interaction together. Then we go on to something else, you know, and studying grammar or whatever. But a really good technique that's underused in my field is what's called dyadic pairs. And especially first year college students who I teach, they're in this drive to find friends. It's, it's the, what I call the, the, the dangerous year from high school to college when the rates of depression and suicide go triple oh. for students. Because at the end of high school, they're you know going through entrance exams and things like that. And the first years of college, they're, they're suddenly thrown out of this community into a place where they don't know anybody and they need friends at that time. So I do this thing called dyadic circles where student pairs will face each other They'll do some interaction. I'll have a couple of minutes. I'll say change. Everybody shifts a person to the right and they do it again. And doing that three or four times lets them meet people they don't know, not just their friends, but new friends. Mm -hmm. And the more times I do that kind of activity in a class, the more the students will respond later that they like the class because their, their drive is to find friends. And yeah. teachers anywhere. You know, instead of like, we're too focused on ourselves. One advice I give to young people is forget yourself, you know, young teachers. Forget about the curriculum or what you have to do today. And instead, focus on their needs and watch them very carefully. And so, yeah. So having students setting up activities where students can interact or make friends leads to better learning. It's putting students in the brain state that they need to be in for learning. It, Did I skip it, anything? It's uh, six thirty here in the morning. So, <laughs> well, that brings <laughs> us in that some something that we were going to discuss anyway. The the story side of things, because you had mentioned that the brain is wired to learn from stories, and I'd really like to to understand what you mean by that. It, 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 okay. it, it, very selfishly, I'll throw it out there. I'll be honest with y'all. Um, it's just totally selfish because then uh, Sarah and I have a shared document for podcasts. And the, the very top of that for the last year has been, what is your story? Oh, yes. So, because we, I mean, through our discussion, we're like, we really need to eat. We need to know what the story is. And we're teaching content, but we want to know what the story is behind it. And so it, somehow we've migrated to that. And so uh, it, then it, when we're, emailing with you you're like yeah you know the brain is wired to learn from stories and so i really want to know more about that and uh, possibly just so i can say yeah we were on it um <laughs> well it uh, there have been people in my field that have said that kind of minor people that you know tell stories in class and whatnot and i heard the first one about 25 years ago andrew wright and so i started getting kind of 
good stories for the classroom to, to tell at the end of class. And the kind of stories that worked weren't like, you know, Aesop's fables or ancient folk tales, but things like chicken soup for the soul. I don't know if you're old enough to know that, that series that came out with, you know, really moving stories by, by people. I go through those and pick out stories and, you know, simplify them and tell them at the end of the class. And suddenly the class become quiet and everybody was completely absorbed in it. So let me know that there is something special about stories. And then of class reviews too. You know, I mean, I teach these 85 minute lessons with five minute stories and what everybody commented on in the reviews was you know, the class evaluations was how the stories were so good. So I started doing research on that. And let me just give you a little bit of scientific data here. Some things were found kind of the 80s and the early 90s were sort of the age of narrative and research and education. There's not too much going on now, but a little bit. But like um, Oakes found that retention from narrative lectures is better than traditional lectures. A couple of people, Berkowitz and Taylor found that children rec recall more information from narrative lectures and like expository passages if they read them. And then there's other research that shows that this is true for kindergartners, high schoolers, adults. Um, one study's found that uh, narrative texts are read and learned twice as fast and retained twice as long as expository texts. And uh, even in for science teachers, having students make a little narrative out of some information themselves helps them recall. And the big one was two studies that found that students given lists of words to remember compared to any way they want to do it, like repeating or writing them down or practicing that way. The students that were given lists of words and told to make stories out of them, even silly stories, remembered the words two to seven times more words than the other group. So there's a super thing about stories that our brains are built to understand stories, to get information from it and to retain it. Learn twice as quickly and remember twice as long. Now, see, that, to, to me, that makes sense. And, because, and, yeah. it's, it, and someone listening might be like, well, I'm not a teacher. You know, I, I, maybe you're not a public teacher, public school teacher, but we're all teachers at some point. We're always, we're just, at some point, we're all trying to teach someone something different. And so thinking about the concept of how you're trying to teach them, I remember when I worked in a factory, I mean, teaching someone literally the effective way of opening and folding boxes and stuff like that. But it's, I, I think the things I remember the most were, were probably the things from Coop stuff that were telling me stories. Oh, this person did this. My, okay, I know not to do that. You know, yeah. <laughs> things like that. It's, yeah. those, those are things that helped me remember when, when well, I was before I was in education. Psychology Today magazine interviewed a lawyer who'd won 300 cases. I don't think he'd ever lost one at the time they interviewed him. And they said, How, what's your secret? And he says, why put everything into a story? If there's legislation of whether to put a traffic light on this corner or not, I'll tell him a story. Well, imagine you're driving down the street and your daughter's next to you and you can't see this truck coming the other way. You know, he uses stories to convince the audience of, of the point he's making. And you have children, don't you, Stephen? Like oh, yes. Ten year old. Well, no, no. You, it's, now they're a little older. They're older. Okay. Do you tell your children's? Did you tell your children's stories when they were little? Oh, I didn't. I still do. And they what don't advantage? Do as much as they used to. <laughs> what advantage do you think that gives children? I think it helped them be more creative. It may help them think about things differently. That was one uh -huh. thing that I did early on. Um, I remember my son and, and I mean, sure, I read books at times and stuff, but there were more we were making up stories and working on imagination and and then tying in different things. And it's like even in, when in the classroom, one of my favorite lessons as I'm thinking through fourth grade is we talk about rock cycle. One of my favorite lessons is tell a story. They have to write a story about a rock. 
Now, in that, in my rubric, oh. you have, right, so what are we doing? You, you, you pick a rock and you name that rock. You tell me the story behind it. So maybe they found a metamorphic rock. Oh, my rock is, name is George. George has had a lot of pressure over time, a lot of pressure <laughs> to help form George. And, you know, it's all these different things. And they have to come up with this background, the story of this rock. And that's like, so this I, is I, for I, a ge geology class. Hmm? Is this for a geology class? Uh, this was for an elementary class, just a regular elementary, elementary class. class. You're still teaching geology to some degree. Yep. Well, yeah, E.O. Wilson, this is one of the reasons that we've evolved to get information from stories. Uh, E.O. Wilson said something. Um, the stories we tell each other and ourselves are survival manuals. Yeah. They're, they're, they give us information about how to navigate in the world, mm -hmm. especially the really complicated social world that we, we all, we're all living in. And that's why people who read stories um, tend to be better at understanding other people. People who read a lot of fiction are better at understanding other people's perspectives. There have been some studies that have found that. And I, I don't know, like romance novels, are fifty percent of all the books sold are romance novels, and something like ninety-seven percent of the readers are women. And boy, all the women I've ever engaged with know a lot more about what romance should be than I do. I failed so many times, but they always, always seem to be. Uh, I feel like this is a dangerous road. <laughs> I, I have to, maybe we have to cut this out. I'm not sure. This, this is Japan, where we really we don't. It could be less PC, I suppose, with me. I'm not oh. sure that's okay for America. <laughs> I think, in gen generally speaking, though, what you're saying, I think it makes sense. Your brain makes sense from the story, so it's a it's a way of organizing information. And, and like you said, with the students given list of words to organize them however they would like, whether it's a song or, you know, alphabetically, yeah. or you know, that there's there's something to that, placing it into a, a story narrative that's going to help you remember it better. I think it's just that maybe that organizational process that the brain goes through to remember that. So it's, it's, it's a type of organization. Oh, that's, that's good, Sarah, because we don't remember the story wrote necessarily. We're always putting ourselves in the story. <laughs> Somehow we're one of the characters. We don't realize that, but we're getting the kind of the moral value from that. Well, anyway, can I tell you a story, a little short one? This is about stories, so we should have a story. Well, of course. That makes yeah. sense. <laughs> I, I have a daughter, and when she was, you know, like three or four years old, I really thought about what kind of a daughter do I want to raise? I have two daughters, actually, but this is the first one. Her name's Alice. What kind of a daughter do I want to raise? I want to raise one who's smart and education and scholarly, like most Japanese parents raise their kids. And I thought... I want to raise a daughter who has a really good heart, you know, human relations. And so every night I'd make up stories about, you know, friends fighting and getting, getting along. And I was trying to make stories that would give her information about the heart of relationships, accepting people that other people don't like, those kind of stories every single night. I've got probably 1,200 recorded in my iPhone. And I wasn't sure if that was working or not. But then one day something happened. I was downstairs in the bedroom reading a book. My wife screamed, ah, Kelly! And she came running down the stairs. And I knew that scream, that means there was a bug in the living room or something. And she said, that's it, there's a little, there's a really strange bug in the living room. It was just a little thing like this, you know, a strange bug in the living room. I said, okay, I'll get it. And I took some tissue and started to go upstairs and Alice started to look really disturbed. And she was behind my mom, my her mother when she when they ran down the stairs. And I said, "Don't worry, Alice, I'll get it." And he said, "No, Daddy, you're carrying tissue. That means you're going to kill it. But that bug has a mommy and a daddy too." <laughs> and just at that moment, she was four years old, Alice. You know, making that connection, I knew the stories were working. <laughs> I said, "Okay, Alice, I'll come with me." We took the bug, got on the tissue, opened the window, and 
that's a story about how stories work. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I know when we do the teacher professional development workshops, I think the teachers remember the stories we tell a lot more than they remember the content we're telling. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the thing about stories, older stories have a different moral message, like don't trust strangers. Mm -hmm. You can only count on your family. Stay out of the woods because it's dangerous. <laughs> well, maybe that's still useful, but... <laughs> but that's why chicken soup for the soul modern stories about modern people facing real problems and resolving them that's why those kind of stories are useful for my college students because mm -hmm. they're going through what's called moral development this is an old idea in psychology in their late teens where they're trying to break away from their families and to do that they have to have their own sense of right or wrong and values so they're just like drinking up these stories which are kind of showing them about human relations and of course we watch stories all the time in movies and television shows and other things so story is a big part of our lives but that's why you know if you can't like uh, john cabot's insight if you can't stop you can't stop the waves but you can learn how to ride them so finding these places where young people are developing and riding that way works so well for us teachers. I certainly like that analogy. And I think a lot of times where it we're not aware that there is a story because we haven't thought yeah. about it. And I love that you're you're talking yeah. about how, you know, it's research is supporting the fact that we do comprehend and we retain a lot better when things are in a story form. A lot of times we don't realize it's I mean if you think about any popular movie, whatever your genre, there's a story behind in that each of those. And so it's it we are retaining and enjoying at a subconscious level, we don't even realize the story, the fact of the story, the storytelling, the unfolding. Mm -hmm. And what, one of the mo what, mo more popular, um, I don't understand why more popular than us, but one of the more popular uh, types of podcasts are your your crime, your true crime podcasts. I know, I know my wife listens to these things. and uh, But it's someone telling the story of what happened. And so uh, I think that uh -huh. goes to even support what, what you're saying with the research is saying that we all tend to, uh, our brains is kind of wired. We retain better. We understand better when it's a story form. And uh, that, well, that, that, that leads to a second reason why stories are so powerful. Mm -hmm. And that is our brains are built to work through metaphor. Hmm. So the story might be, you know, like the, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, which we're never going to encounter a bear or get lost in the forest or like Sleeping Beauty fall asleep for, for you know, 20 days, what was it, a year or something like that, you know, Long time. Disney <laughs> stories. But we can take information out of those and, and, and use it ourselves because our brains are built for metaphor and language too. This is where uh, Johnson and Lakoff have done a lot of research. And basically, at the, at the very neuro, you know, the neurological level, when we learn something new, we don't make a whole new area of the brain where that information is kept. Our brain's always connecting older areas to solve tasks, existing areas. And so we're using what we already have and then making something new out of it. And that's what I'm saying, it's a little bit hard to explain, but that's what we do when we learn words and things too. Now we're finding out from cognitive psychology and other areas that words in our brains aren't like little dictionary entries. They're actually based on physical experiences. So if I say Justin Timberlake has a velvety voice, you hear timber and lake in your auditory area will flash timber and lakes until you realize it's a name. Velvet will cause your somatosensory area to light up in the, the feel of velvet. Mm -hmm. That's so we're actually taking our own physical experiences in the real world to understand what language is, including abstract language, like couch potato. There's a really, you know, easy metaphor to understand. How I am on weekends, but yeah, it's all of us understand that a little too well. <laughs> so our brain is really good at taking ideas and transferring them into something else for us. So metaphor. 
It's kind so of reminds me. I know I, I get a lot of good feedback from kids. Um, when we like, let's say if, if we were learning something about something about the elements or something in a chemistry class, uh, I always had a bad, well, I don't know that's a bad habit, but I would personify the elements. So if we're talking about how they're related in a column or something, say, well, these are the cool kids on the block, you know, all the other elements want to be like them and they're going to do it. And, and years later, I would, kids come back to me. I love thinking about, you know, these, talk to them like they were people and they're not, and, and then at some point I'd have to stop and be like, I know I keep calling like treating them like people they're not they don't know what they're doing they're just there you know in this space <laughs> interact they don't know what they're doing but the kids seem to relate better and, and now it's kind of like listening to you say this I think well that kind of makes sense I guess it, it's not that it was a story but it was making it relatable for them to learn some it, that's exactly it's what you're doing your metaphor is basically describing something complicated by something else we already know yeah. We all know people, we know good kids on the block, you know, so right. which, which, uh, which elements are the good kids on the block, by the way? Oh, <laughs> <Hydrogen> <laughs> or... <laughs> the, um, I, the halogen column, I would say, so the noble gases, let's see, I, which ones were, yeah, I always talked about the noble gases because they just, they, they had that full outer shell, that full valence shell, and they just, they were cool, they liked themselves how they were, and they, they didn't <laughs> want to bond to them. Now all the other, and so the halogens were right next to them. So I'd always say, you know, they would stop at nothing to be like the noble gas that they're right next to. They, they would they would steal and do whatever they could to be like these. And so the kids would get these, you know, they build these relationships on the, you know, what, yeah. you know, however they're electron. That, that's a, yeah, but that's perfect. That's a perfect example how to make somebody connect to something and relate to it in a way that they understand it. You know that these are the good kids and these are the bad kids and <laughs> you know, everybody else. So yeah, that, that's that's a perfect example of how our brains are built to learn things through metaphor too. Yeah, no, I like that. That, so, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And so you you've already identified some of the reasons why stories, our brains are recall stories. They they teach us about life. They help us understand complex things through metaphor and give us rules for how to do things. I remember once when I had this really terrible situation with my girlfriend at the time, I remembered a story of somebody else and it made me change my whole attitude about it and treat her differently that she wanted to break up was really good for her, you know, I mean, something like that. But yeah, stories give us these manuals for living life and they deal with metaphor. But, but there's one more reason why the narrative format fits our brains. And this is, there are some studies that found that familiarity and interestingness, you know, we think, well, stories are interesting, so we remember them. But there's another reason. There's just something, the narrative format itself that fits our brains. I'm going to see if you can guess what that is. It took me years to find, figure this out. But what, if I were to just make the sentence, the, the brain is a something something machine. What words could you put in there? Of course, there's many possible words. Oh, uh, oh mercy. Uh, I would say ever evolving or ever changing. Ever evolving. I mean about what, it, what the brain does. So you may say a brain's a thinking machine. Mm -hmm. And that, that's kind of true to some degree, although, but there's another word that starts with a P that I heard on a podcast once and just completely changed my thinking. This is all you, sir. Um, I Something our brain's doing all the time. In fact. Processing. Um, so what? Processing. Processing, okay, getting closer. It's a kind of process. Okay. In fact, um, people, <clears throat> some researchers, some experts in memory say the only reason we have memory is so that we can upcoming situations. <laughs> Predict. Yes, that's it. So the brain I'm like, I'm struggling here. <laughs> <laughs> to predict what's maybe coming. 
Yes. The reason, the only reason we have memory is so we can predict what's going to happen in the next few seconds, you know, in this situation. Um, like if I'm riding my bicycle down a hill, I'm going to remember that time I saw a movie of somebody falling over on the hill or, or, or when I lost control myself, so I'm going to slow down. Uh, so yeah, our brains are prediction machines. We're constantly predicting the next few seconds, unconsciously, you know, subconsciously, of course, and what's going to happen. I like this. I, I really like this, especially because it's a, uh... One of the things we recently pushed was an older podcast that we did with Mike Baldwin, who's a meteorologist. He talked about weather models and how weather models, mm -hmm. and I'd asked him in, the, in an interview because I taught it this way, and he's like, yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm like, so weather models aren't really necessarily predicting the future as much as they're telling us the past. They're saying, you know, 50 per, you know 60 percent of the time when the weather conditions were about like this, this happened. And so basically, oh. you're just telling us of what already happened. And so I, and this ties yeah. in. I mean, this fits really well, I think, with what you're saying. Not only are meteorological models kind of using the past to predict the future, we're doing that internally as well. Yes, with our internal models. There's a perfect metaphor again. You know, our brain is developing all these models about how the brain works. I mean, it's how the world works. You know, th that we get through novels and through movies and from our own experiences and talking to friends. And we're seeing if these models work or something strange, it some of you all stop because that means there's this new rewiring going on. There's a whole field in neuroscience called predictive processing that I'm just completely fascinated with. And actually, you know, we've always thought of the brain as being like a computer, you know, processing incoming information, but it's not. We're actually predicting things happening. And actually, rather than just getting input and then processing it, we're predicting what we're going to see. And it's only the things that don't sort of match our predictions that make us stop and we take notice of. Mm -hmm. They're actually outgoing oscillations in our brain to our sensory areas that'll, what we're already predicting, that'll kind of delete incoming information that already fits it. So it's only the things that don't fit our expectations that come through. Like if I see somebody with, um, uh, what's a coffee shop, uh, McDonald's coffee sitting in a Starbucks, I'll take a kind of second look because I'm expecting yeah. everybody who's going to have Starbucks cups. In fact, I might not even see that it's a McDonald's cup. I might even gloss over that, you know, because my brain's already predicting it'll be Starbucks cups that people be holding. So, you know, I may not even see that. And that also gets into some of the terrible things that happen where police shoot people when they pull a phone out of their pocket or a pen or something. They say, well, I thought it was a gun. Well, actually they did see a gun because in that traumatic situation, that dangerous situation, that's what their brain is already predicting. And they don't have time to really look carefully. So, so we have some of the tragedies that occur from that sort of super predictive process of the brain. Well, think about stories, the narrative arc. Stories are all cause and effect. Mm -hmm. He said this, so she did that. She did that, so they did this. Stories are all cause and effect, and that fits the way that our brain operates in the world. Cause and effect and prediction, right? Yeah. So that's another reason the stories are so easy to pull in and use in our models and predictive processes unlike a lecture which is taking thing and breaking it down into categories and you know one twos and threes and lists and things like that so that's another reason that the stories are so powerful as learning tools our brains are prediction machines i like that i had not thought of it that way but yeah i guess that is pretty much what i'm doing constantly is predicting aren't i mm -hmm. <laughs> That's oh my. also <laughs> so that, that's also how you do language. Grammar is a tool that was developed by the predictive processing parts of our brain to reduce the cognitive load of having to process each word as it comes in. And I, I gave an ex I gave a presentation on stories, as a matter of fact, in, in 2016 at a TESOL conference in Seattle. And 
one of the things he said was this, you Americans, I can't believe you elected, this is 2016, I stopped there and everybody just started laughing <laughs> because this was after the US election. So uh -huh. they already, already filled in that sentence with the name of a president that was yeah. elected in 2016. I can't believe you elected, pause, and everybody starts laughing. I said, elected to come here to my presentation today instead of being out and playing tennis in this wonderful weather. No, well, anyways, but we're already predicting what words will be coming after the beginning of a sentence because of you know what's already there. And again, it's the models like meteorology based on uh, previous conditions. If I say he ate, there's only so many things that can fit into that last slot. Uh, you know, some kind of food or something like that, probably. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how our brains work as prediction machines with language too. So I'm, I'm laying a lot of stuff on you. This is all, you know, coming out of the- It is, because I haven't thought of it that way. I know. So, well, and, you know, I'm thinking of this a little beyond this too. Um, my children have such a straight, well, what I think is such a strange, they find some of the strangest things funny. They're and your kids, they Sarah. especially, yeah. They're your kids. I know. Well, okay. Right. So we'll give them that. There's. <laughs> okay, Sarah, you got kids. I, I, I wasn't sure whether it was okay to ask or not. Yeah. So well, so my, my son right now is, <laughs> he's 16 and uh -huh. he to share with me thing like these things on TikTok or just different. He's like, mom, this is so funny. And he wants me to watch these with him and I'll watch it. And I'm just like, Riley, that's not funny, you know? And no, this is the funniest thing, you know I said? But when I'm, I'm listening to you talk about this predictive thing and it's hitting me now, I think it's, I think what he's finding funny is things that are not able to be predicted. I think it's something, it's like something that's totally off base that I'm not finding it funny at all because it's not what I'm predicting. And I think that's exactly what he's finding funny is it's so shocking that he like, it's, it's, he doesn't know how else to respond. Good, good, good. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. This is good. <laughs> and think about humor is basically interrupting our predictions. Yeah. You know, if I say I found a bomb in my office, clip art file you know because <laughs> right. you're expecting you know you're processing it one way and then suddenly there's something that changes from that yeah so humor is going against our predictive processing to give us something surprising and we're very sensitive to novelty and error novelty is basically what we don't expect but we're very sensitive to that because that means our model's not working. So our brain releases dopamine and other neurotransmitters that cause us to rewire that model and incorporate new stuff to it or change it. And that's why we feel good because dopamine is the neurotransmitter of reward, motivation, and uh, kind of neural rewiring and, and many other things. But So that's why humor or your son is sort of surprised by these TED Talks that don't go the way that he expects, but maybe you understand it because you've been around in the world longer. So, you know, yeah. That's so, well, and, and um, I had a teacher one time say that a lot of times laughter is our response when we don't know how else to respond. Sometimes I'll find myself laughing at things that just aren't funny at all. And I don't know why I'm laughing. My mom has this problem too. And we'll just like, people are, people must think we're crazy. <laughs> well, you know, Stephen will say, yeah, you know, I know. <laughs> I, I would say completely not normal, but Stephen is a crazy one. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, I, this is very, very interesting to, to hear these, um, these insights. Now, and, you're, you have a range of kids, Sarah, though. Well, would you say you're the youngest? That's half that way. Is it the similar? Yes. So my, I don't know about the about uh, unpredictive. Your youngest is unpredictive. Yeah, he's about as unpredictive as you can get. He's ten. So, um, yeah, he, yeah, his humor is probably more in line. Well, I think it's cute, but it's probably more of it. But yeah, very different from what the sixteen-year-old is finding funny. <laughs> I like the fact that I mean, you're throwing out. I mean basically you defined humor i mean dang yeah i know i uh, did not expect someone to define humor for me but, but in the, the thing is you're you're right when i think yeah. about it mm -hmm. 
and I, I never like to admit yeah. when people are right, but yeah, when I think about it, it's, it's, it's going against what I'm predicting. And that, that's why mm-hmm. it's, it strikes you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's very yeah. striking. Yeah. Novelty causes this dopamine. So novelty, in addition to stories, novelty is another thing that people learn from. So if I'm teaching, you know, fruit vocabulary, I'll say, okay, everybody please repeat grapes, oranges, pigs, apples. What? What? Did you say pigs? And they'll laugh a little bit, but they'll remember the other words too, because their brain uh, gives them a little spurt of dopamine because of that error that they encountered. And so they'll remember all the things from that experience better. Wow. And if so, you think about humor too, did you notice that humor in some cultures doesn't it doesn't transfer across cultures very well mm-hmm. because we have these different models. And in fact, how do we get culture? Why do most Americans have basically the same culture? Where does that how is that instilled in us? A lot of it's through stories. Like now, John, you know, if I turn on Netflix, it says John Wick 2 is now available. John Wick and Rambo and Die Hard. Those are all stories that are telling you that one person can do it all. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're self-sufficient and you're strong enough, you can you can succeed. Even Home Alone, you know, that old one. But if you look at Japanese stories, cartoons, Mulan and all these, it's. Uh-huh. That is yeah, but you. right, all all the uh, the princesses, and fortunately, the new Disney with um, the Miranda family without a princess for a change. But all of these stories are kind of giving us this sort of cultural values. Whereas Japanese stories are, you can't succeed by yourself. So Momotaro is fighting the ogres, and he has to get a team together. And the Seven Samurai, you know, the they have to have a team to do it. That the individual is not strong, it's the group that's strong. So it's teaching kind of more of an individualistic orientation versus a groupistic orientation, you know, group oriented culture. So even culture comes to us through stories a lot of times. Oh, no, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, being, <laughs> I've never been immersed outside of a U.S. culture more than a week um, or two, I guess, here and there. And so uh, that's uh, that, that's very that's very insightful. Mm-hmm. It's very insightful that, that about that. I had once again not thought of it that way. It, well, mm-hmm. I guess I, I was ignorant of it because I didn't know what other cultures, what their dominant story was, mm-hmm. as you put. And so that's huh. Interesting. Well, let's take stories a little bit further then. Um, now we're beginning to understand that even your personal identity is a, the collection of stories about yourself that you have. And we have a part of this, this, the default mode network in the brain. We used to think it was just where daydreaming happened. It wasn't very important, but it was always turning on at kind of interesting times. Now we're finding out this, this default mode network is really involved in all kinds of processing, all thinking about the future, prediction. And it's also part of the story maker is mainly located there. Taking in information and making a story from it. Why is that happening? We make a little story, you know, the cause and effect and things like that. And even your personal identity is like a collection of stories about yourself from the past. Psychologists are believing that these days. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a pretty interesting thought. It definitely plausible as I reflect. Yeah, I mean, it's once you get to be, you know, over a couple hundred years old like I am, <laughs> and to be telling the same stories quite frequently. And uh, yeah, I don't know how many times my kids are like, oh yeah, this story again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I get that too, and I think it's, it's because of you know memory problems for them. <laughs> Oh, I already told him that one. Oh, shucks, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, this is awesome. This, this was insightful. Like I said, I kind of expected stories, but then we progressed beyond that. And I love the fact that the information, especially about your, your brain releasing dopamine, uh, when you encounter something 
counterintuitive, I'll say, that you're trying to predict. I, I absolutely love that. because That's, again, something I didn't know. And so uh, my brain's a little excited now because I got to learn something new today. And we certainly appreciate the time that you've taken to uh, help enlighten us and our audience. Is it audience? Is that what we say? Network? I don't know what they are. All those people that actually listen. And uh, <laughs> we appreciate you if you're listening. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can, can I give, can I just mention somebody that I appreciate? No you interviewed her a couple weeks ago, Ginger Campbell, mm -hmm. the Brain Science Podcast. I was just a typical teacher that was making students miserable, wondering out how not to. So, you know, studying psychology and culture helped a bit, but it was really what helped me get into neuroscience were her podcasts, the Brain Science Podcast. Awesome. And I've listened to every one of them. There's about 190 or something like that, more now. But that's been my like graduate school about the brain and helping me realize there's a lot of stuff out there that's not making it to education mm -hmm. but learning and language are both like deep processes of the brain we've got to know more as teachers and they're not teaching us in graduate school so that's what sort of led me towards producing this magazine or making these organizations that are to learn more about how the brain works like the importance of stories the importance of emotion and learning um, that our brains are predicting language rather than processing each word as it comes in you know, there's lots of things in there that could make us better teachers and so i have to say thanks to ginger campbell for those wonderful podcasts and all the people she's interviewed that have changed my life so we definitely I'm not a superhero science but she's brought them to me myself so. no one thinks they are but uh i know say so we we definitely enjoyed uh, interviewing her and uh, yeah. I, I, i'm on her mailing list now uh after we <laughs> interviewed her i was immediately on her mailing list i'm like all right this is even cooler than i realized and so uh yeah those those are that's one that i listen to myself now yeah so, yes, she's helped a lot of us. um we appreciate immensely your time with this yes uh, thank, thank you so much sharing with us mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to this episode of Science from the Experts from Purdue University Superheroes of Science. If you like this episode, subscribe, give us a positive view, and share the love. Boiler up! Hammer down! <laughs>